Welcome to the fifth module of the SLP's ABC's series. This program is Know Your Facts, Expository Discourse. The program will focus on the structures of expository discourse, the poor comprehension that results when these structures are not understood, and the interventions we can use to improve expository knowledge across the age span from preschool through high school. The use of Go charts as a visual strategy will be modeled. We hope you enjoy the program and get some great ideas from the discussion. All rights reserved. Expository discourse is a discourse that explains or describes a topic. So if we look at our Example, the wind is important for more than flying kites or making a wind chime to make music. Without the wind, our world wouldn't have any people, food, or animals. It does not primarily present contingent events or focus on a performer of actions as narrative would. So narrative focuses on the person performing the actions. This one is... and. And uh, narrative also looks at one event that causes another one um, in some sort of uh, attachment way. Rather, the topic is factual, like science, history, or math, and information is logically oriented around a theme or topic. So first we talk about the wind and the heat from the sun, then we talk about um, how the earth would not have any living things on it because the rest of the world would be too cold and one place would be too hot. And then we talk about how our country would be under ice. And so basically we have a, a several facts that are logically oriented around the theme or the topic. Classroom instruction is largely expository. So even when we have a subject like reading, there's still a lot of expository discourse that children have to follow. So as the teacher is explaining the use of the silent E, she basically is using expository, de um, expository discourse. About 30% of the content in a reading book, which in first and second grade has lots of narrative stories, includes lots of nonfiction articles. So this is an example of the bibliography that they provide of the author, which is an expository text. Also, 70 to 80 percent of standardized reading test content is expository discourse. So when you look at Dibble's passages or you look at um, any of the reading tests. The majority of the passages are actually going to be expository discourse rather than narrative. So obviously children who don't understand the structures of expository discourse are going to have a harder performance in their daily schoolwork as well as high stakes testing. They're also going to have more difficulty following directions, which is a common goal for speech language pathologists. So perhaps it would help us to work on the expository discourse structures rather than working on instructions per se. By the time children are in late, late grade school, so end of third onward, um, expository text makes up the majority of their day. Expository discourse, again, is a structure, and so it's both in spoken and written forms. This entire program will be expository discourse. I won't be telling many stories as we go along. I'll be giving factual information and trying to organize it logically. It informs, reports, explains, describes a topic. Factual and supported by research as well as cultural knowledge. As we said, the classroom teacher uses it in many ways, not only to help the children understand history and social studies and science, but also to explain classroom rules or procedures the children are to follow. And then textbooks also expect the children to follow headings and different kinds of structures within the book to figure out what kind of expository discourse the children are supposed to be using to interpret the text. Children themselves have to use a lot of expository discourse to explain rules and procedures to each other and follow them, but also they are expected to give reports as they get older 
that are often in the form of expository text. They are supposed to be able to write on topics, set short essays, and comprehensive reports following expository discourse. Obviously with each grade level all of the demands for language are going to go up so you have to be able to pick the right type of expository discourse for the piece that you're writing. You're supposed to be able to choose the correct syntactic sentences in order to embed the information and use the, the correct transition words that we'll talk about soon. Um, and then of course coordinate the spelling and the other aspects of language. Research has shown that at all grade levels children find expository texts more difficult to read and comprehend than narratives. Last time we talked about how narrative was the way that the mind basically organized our world information. Most children go through school without a lot of explicit instruction on expository texts just like they do narrative. They acquire greater understanding of the structures and the genres of expository text with each grade level, partially from reading, partially from classroom instruction. But language disordered children, once again, have shown not to be able to infer these structures, and as the grade levels increase, they struggle with comprehension and production of expository discourse. There's much research that shows you can improve a person's ability to read, interpret, and use expository discourse. That children improve in comprehension and also retention of information when they have been taught these structures. Both reading and writing have been shown to improve when you teach the five most common expository text structures in several research programs. Those are description, sequence, compare and contrast, cause and effect, and problem solution. A lot of people think of expository discourse as very different from narrative discourse, but when you look at it, they really are just parallel structures. They have different content, but the formats are pretty much the same. So at the highest level you have the interactive where multiple topics are interwoven within a single text. You have parallel topics, two or more subtopics, compare contrast, problem solution, cause effect, sequencing, description, associated topics, and random ideas. So we talked about this when we talked about narrative. Narrative can have a random idea, so can expository. Narrative can just have a collection of topics and actions that are loosely associated, so can um, expository. Descriptive list would just be parts of the story, um, especially common when you're describing a setting. So you can say the bears lived in a house in the woods, the house was small, the house was made out of trees, the house was warm and cozy, and that's just describing. We have a lot of expository text where it's the same thing. Ordered sequence basically means a time element, reactive sequence is cause effect, plan or purpose means you're trying to solve a problem so you have to form a plan. A complete structure compares and contrasts and appraises. A compound has two or more episodes. Parallel has two different kinds of topics developing next to each other. And interactive has the interwoven topic. So it's the same whether you're talking about narrative or whether you're talking about expository text. These are some examples. At the discrete level, if it's narrative, the child just might say they're a kitty. Um, in the discrete, they, in the expository, they might say the frog says ribbit. In a collection over here in narrative, Susie throws a ball, there's a tree, he drives a car, the sun is out. So the child is basically just collecting ideas by looking at the picture and talking about them. There's a frog, there's water, the squirrel climbs a tree, the sun is out, very similar. A descriptive list 
which is the first level where you actually have some topic main, maintained. The dog says woof, the cat says meow, the duck says quack, the pig says oink would be a narrative. Um, and the, the descriptive list would be the frog says rivet, the frog is green, the frog is sitting on a log, the log is in the pond. So they're not very different from each other at that point. However, when we start moving up the ladder a little bit in terms of ordered sequence, first the boy climbed up a hill, the boy rolled down the hill, the boy jumped up on the grass, and then the boy sat down. The action is focusing on the person and what their actions are. First a mother frog lays eggs, the egg hatches into a tadpole, the tadpole eats and grows, the tail is lost and the back legs grow. Now we see that we're f focusing on a process. So there is no superstar like the frog. It quickly switches from the frog to the eggs to the tadpole to the tail because the sequence is basically a time-oriented procedure of what happens in nature. At the reactive sequence again in the narrative it's going to focus on the person. The boy rode a bike, the bike hit a bump, and the boy hurt his knee. So we've got that cause effect going on without planning. Over here in the expository the frog sits on logs. When a bug flies by the frog will stick out his tongue. He eats up the bug. When we have a problem solution or a plan and purposeful one we have the monkey wanted so we now have theory of mind or into the psychological causality in the story the monkey wanted the banana on the banana tree he moved a box and so his here's his solution he moved a box under the tree and he climbed up and grabbed it over in the expository side frogs are disappearing global warming water shortages are the cause we must change how we live and work and produce food so this is a problem solution up in the complete structure where we have compare and contrast the girl wanted a new dress she went to the bank and took all of her money out and spent it on the dress now she has no money for food that was foolish she said so we basically have a comparison of what she had before versus afterwards and her appraisal of it over in the expository side Technically, frogs and toads are all frogs. True frogs include 400 species, and true toads include 300 species. Um, frog, frogs' back legs are adapted for hopping. The toads' back legs are adapted for walking. So we've compared and contrasted toads and frogs. Now, compound, remember, just means usually we don't have just one episode in either a story or one episode in just a text about some expository topic. So compound in both cases come to an end. So chapter one was bullfrogs, then chapter two common frogs, then green frogs, then wood frogs. Um, over on the narrative side Goldilocks eats the porridge, she selects the chairs, she sleeps in the beds, and then she escapes. So the episodes are going to follow one after another. In complex, you've got parallel episodes. We've used the 101 Dalmatians as our example, where you've got the dogs and their goals, and we've got Cruella de Vil and her goals. In the complex things, we might talk about what do frogs eat? Frogs play an important role in the environment. What animals eat frogs? How do frogs protect themselves? So you basically have frogs who are the predators versus other animals who prey on frogs. So you've got those parallel perspectives. And in interactive, you've got the multiple um, different kinds of levels of different subplots of the story interweaving with each other in a story like Gone with the Wind or an expository text. You've got a complex discussion of frogs from dinosaurs to modern species with flashbacks, compositions, multiple interwoven episodes. Okay, so again, they parallel each other. It's one brain. It's going to organize information very similarly, whether it's narrative information or expository information. One of the best visuals um, to help in intervention are graphic organizers or GO, graphic organizer charts, so Go charts. These have been around a long time and they can be very, very effective for language disordered children because they're so visual and they give them ways of thinking about information. They're visual and spatial. Um, the format itself helps the children 
see what they're supposed to do. So this is a topic with just a lot of factual information related to it. So that would be a descriptive list. This one has compare and contrast. So information that's different goes on the outside, the information that's the same. So the comparison and the contrast. So you can see this would be a temporal sequence. First these things happen, then this happens, and then this happens next. Um, The lines between the nodes can indicate the direction of the relationship and it can profile the most important topics or points of information. It can also be used to organize your own information before you talk or you, to plan your own writing before you begin to write something that you need to have um, express in a particular format. I like hierarchical go charts and use them the most. They are similar to outlining, only the information is displayed visually. So outlining is very confusing often to kids with language disorders because you have to hold the information in short term memory and think about the information or reflect on the information in layers of categories and that's one of the things our kids tend to not be good at. Um, so basically this is an alternative because it visually lays out what things are on the same level of organization and which things trickle down to main ideas and then details. The topic is placed on the top of the hierarchy equivalent to the Roman numeral 1 for example. And then the subtopics are used to explain or support. So these are equivalent to the capital letters on an outline. So we can have our example of, you know, frogs. And one subtopic might be what they eat. Another subtopic might be um, how they swim. Another subtopic might be where the varieties of different kinds of frogs or how they differ from toads. So you're basically looking in a book at a couple of paragraphs about this subtopic and then it moves on to a couple of paragraphs about this subtopic, etc. Very similar to outlining. This would be Roman numeral 1, capital letter A, capital letter B, capital letter C. And then below the subtopics can be main ideas about each one of the subtopics and then supporting details which would be the level of the numerals 1 and 2 and then the small a, small b, small a, small b or lowercase. So this would be an example where we see a more completed hierarchical go chart. This one doesn't have the level of subtopics. This one just is a goes into a single topic that has a main idea, another main idea, and another main idea with supporting details or supporting ideas and then finally details. So there are many many formats of hierarchical graph, graphic organizers depending on how you want to organize the information. Okay but the go charts, and we're going to primarily talk about hier hierarchical ones, but also show others, are going to be used at all these levels um, to help students comprehend and produce text. At the lowest level, or that discrete level, the closest actual written thing that we have might be a definition or a fact. And so you have your written definition and you can organize that into a simple go chart. So in the written definition it's a building in which people live, a residence for human beings. And so we basically give our topic, the house, it's a building, a place where people live. So we've visualized the definition as a single fact for a word such as house. It lacks any text structure since it's a single fact. There's no elaboration or details or additional information. It's just capturing the basic definition. 
We don't usually see this in written text, and it's rarely in spoken discourse, because basically it just means that the person says one thing and then leaves. But, you know, certainly there are situations where that's all the discourse we engage in. However, it may be produced by children who are in beginning stages of writing or those who are very poor writers. So even your older children may still be using a lot of just discrete facts. However, if they use them in combination, then they, call, they are called a collection. So if you're, you have a, a bunch of discrete facts that are just written down on the page that don't make a lot of sense, then basically that's called a collection. That's at the second highest level. So you have a topic and then a new topic and you might give some information about it and then another new topic and you might give some information about it. So this is a person who's topic shifting frequently or it's a text that's topic shifting frequently. There isn't any organization around a single topic or any time sequence or any goal or any problem, so it's a very primitive structure. When you see it in school, it usually has a goal that's unrelated to the actual discourse. So we see lots of this in worksheets, where the first sentence has nothing to do with the second sentence or the third sentence, and we'll look at one of those in a moment. The content okay, shifts randomly because the real focus is on a goal such as identifying all of the nouns or in speech pathology saying all of the words that start with an S sound and we ignore the fact that there is no topic so this is just a collection of words that start with S or a collection of sentences and you're to find the nouns. We also see language disordered kids who will use this kind of discourse when they try to explain a topic and so they're constantly topic shifting. I had a birthday party and I got a bike and one time I fell off my bike and I hurt my knee and it started to bleed and my sister you know was in a car accident and there was blood all over everything and she went to the hospital and the you know Hospital, I had fun because I got to go down to the gift shop and get a prize. So basically, the child topic shifts constantly, which means that their speech is not very organized. It's just a collection of random, loosely organized ideas. As it says, the last idea specified in the object of the sentence becomes the subject of the new topic. So this is a worksheet that's a typical collection. When you look at the content, Katie is the most popular girl in school, which has nothing to do with all the new jeans that I own are the color blue, which has nothing to do with I use my old computer to communicate with friends at night, which has nothing to do with Harry is the name of my dog. Now, I, you know, if I was going to write a worksheet, I would actually make the sentences coherent. So there's every sentence is going to have nouns, and there's no reason why they have to jump around without any topical organization. But as you are well aware of when you think about it, almost all of the work that children do in language arts, for example, is just a collection, just ideas that are just randomly arranged on a page and don't also help the child understand text structure because the goal has nothing to do with the content or the meaning being communicated but rather to pay attention to the form. And again, this is just another diagram of what collections look like if you're a visual person. To find the nouns and then the child who constantly topic shifts. Okay, at level three, which is the first level of discourse that you would actually teach, it's a descriptive list. So it describes something by using detailed factual information. It lists characteristics, features, and examples usually includes but not always a definition, tells facts about something, might include things like the color, size, shape, or weight, 
might tell how something acts or where it is found. So there's our topic. There's the main idea. So we've got three different main ideas. But this time each main idea is supported by details. And this is an example. The Olympic symbol consists of five interlocking rings. The rings represent the five continents, Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, and South America, from which athletes come to compete in the games. The rings are colored black, blue, green, red, and yellow. At least one of these colors is found in the flag of every country sending athletes to compete in the Olympic games. So does it have a topic? Yes. We're throughout the passage for the first time worth maintaining the topic. We're always talking about the rings of the Olympic symbol. Are there te time or temporal connections between the ideas? It consists of five rings. The rings represent five continents. There's no temporal relationship. I could say the rings are colored black, blue, green, red, and yellow, and they represent the five continents. So I can move the order of these around, and it doesn't make much difference to the coherence of the passage. There is no cause effect. There is no planning. It's just a descriptive list of factual information. So if you're trying to teach expository discourse, you can see that even fairly sophisticated writing that they'll be expected to process in school as well as write on their own is still at that level of a descriptive list. It's very common in science, social studies, all of their content areas. This is one way to visualize it. As I said, I like the hierarchical. Um, so first we had some information about the rings, then the continents, and then the flags. So when you look at the first subtopic of rings, then it gave you some main ideas. There are five, they're interlocking, they've been adopted, and then we can have details. Interlocking, because they represent the union of all people, they were adopted in 1914 by the International Committee. And so the this is like a waterfall, basically. The information flows, not in straight lines, but in these waves of information. Again, it's like outlining Roman numeral 1, capital letter A, um, numeral 1, lowercase letters A and B. So basically it's this visual outlining. You can see the relationship between the levels, that, that the important things that were talked about were the rings, the continents, and the flags. And then you can see what kind of details are supporting each one of those main topics. Um, so you can see how if you're giving a passage to a child and you're asking them to comprehend the passage by going through the graphic organizer and figuring out where you would put the subtopics, where you would put the main ideas under those topics and where you would put details, helps the child to start to visualize how the writing of that discourse is actually organized. Then you can ask them to write their own paragraphs. So this would be a paragraph, this would be a paragraph, this would be a paragraph, um, or at least sentences about these main ideas um, or subtopics within that Olympic symbol. Scaffolding that all of us as, you, as speech pathologists use all of the time is really easy with these kinds of hierarchical graphic organizers, which is one of the reasons why I like them. So we can start to talk about um, this topic. So I can use a lot of close procedure, C-L-O-Z-E. So I can say the child reads Olympic symbol is composed of, child says, five rings. The rings are interlocking, the child says, and represent the, child says, union of all people. So you're co-creating the sentences by using the graphic organizer and also scaffolding procedures. The 
rings of the Olympic symbol were adopted in 1940-14 by the International Committee. So by practicing, the child can start to more independently, without the scaffolding, talk about that factual information in a very organized manner. Then you can ask the child to write about the Olympic rings. And so they would write their first couple of sentences about the Olympic rings. And then you would move on to the information about the continents and then finally the flags. So it's one of those things that starts with written language. You read it orally. You make decisions orally about what the main points are, what are the big concepts, and then finally what are the details. And then you use oral language to scaffold it back into sentences that were different from the original written sentences. And then ask the child to productively write about it. So it's a nice process. Just a paragraph or two can be an entire language lesson. Here's another descriptive list that I've done with kids. This one was originally created with Kidspiration, which is just a software program that has pictures that you can insert um, from their menu into your work. So our topic was Tyrannosaurus Rex. Our main ideas were where he lived, what he's known for, what he ate. And then we had, so those were our three subtopics and then we had our main ideas and our supporting details. So we lived 225 million years ago in most continents the, and then a detail the climate was very different than it is today. They're known for being the tallest, the most powerful jaws, the king of the lizard for being quick and then we have some details. The powerful jaws have teeth that are sharp and curved. So Again, the same kind of procedure. We can create all kinds of different sentences by moving around the graphic organizer. Because Tyrannosaurus rex has powerful jaws with sharp curved teeth, they can kill other dinosaurs larger than itself. I said I would show you other kinds of graphic organizers that are used for descriptive text um, besides the go charts that are hierarchical. So this one is very common. It's called a spider. So basically your topic goes in this area and then the details go around. I don't like it as well as the hierarchical because again it just sort of is a brainstorming kind of thing. It doesn't give you layers of the topic, the subtopics, the main ideas, and the details. But it's a great thing for generating ideas. I use these when we're trying to generate ideas about the topic that we'll later put on a hierarchical graphic organizer. And this is just another variation of that same theme. At the next level, or in ordered sequence. You find these in expository text commonly in procedural texts or in things like in history with a timeline where the time sequence becomes important. In procedures you have to do things in the right sequence otherwise you, your cake will fall apart or you have to do things in the correct procedure otherwise the thing that you're making will you know end up distorted. So there's a specific sequence that has to be adhered to. So procedural, as we said, tells somebody how to do something in a series of steps leading to some sort of a goal. It centers on the events one after another. You have to do it in this sequence for the thing to come out correctly. In contrast to narrative, which focuses on the performer of the events, this focuses on the actual actions of the events. So as we showed earlier, it's very similar to narrative, except narrative is the person and what the person is doing. Expository is the thing and the procedure to accomplish creating the thing. Um, they're often organized chronologically. You see a lot of pronouns like first or second or last. Those are signal words that tell you there's a sequence to be found. 
And as we said, the text is not usually oriented around a specific person, although I have, you know, seen a lot of writing, especially in the early grade levels, where they do try to make it a little more a blend of narrative and expository, Well, where they'll say things like, you know, Stephen wanted to, you know, feed the birds. He It was winter and he saw that they were hungry. So first, he asked his dad to help him cut some wood. So I have seen texts that are a blend of both expository and narrative. So when we visualize this, it's a topic with a subtopic and another subtopic, and those things are temporally related to each other. This happens first, which leads to this, which leads to this. With details scattered throughout those steps. Okay, this one is not a procedure. This example is a timeline, which is another example of the temporal sequence. Abraham Lincoln was born in a one-room log cabin in 1809. Three years later, his brother Thomas was born, but he died in infancy. When he was six years old, Abe attended a log schoolhouse. The next year, the family moved to Indiana. In 1818, Abe's mother died. Poor little guy. His father married a widow named Sarah, and Abe liked her. When he was 11, he was able to return to school in the fall and winter. In spring and summer, he worked in the fields. He read books on his own as often as he could. So, obviously there's a time sequence, the 1809 to 1812 part of his life, the 1815 to 1818, and then the 1819 to 1820. So, during those early years he was born, his brother died, then they moved into a log cabin, but he got to go to school and his mother died from milk sickness, and then... His father remarried. He also got to go to school during the seasons when he wasn't working. So once again, if you've got a paragraph like this and you're working on helping the child understand the structure, I like the hierarchical organizers because they so clearly lay out visually for the child what the main topic is, what kinds of things mark the points in time and then you help the child figure out the details. So as you're going through, he was born in a one-room log cabin in 1809, so we're going to put that in as the beginning of the first time marker, and then three years later his brother was born, but he died in infancy. When he was six, well when means you're changing the time sequence, and so we're basically going to say, okay, so the next time sequence is going to be six years old, so if he was born in 1809, that would make it 1815. His brother died three years later, that would be 1812. So again, helping children think through the inferences within the passage and how to organize this information. That helps them understand how they're supposed to about think about text when they read it, how they're supposed to organize it in their mind, and consequently comprehend it better and retain the information better. These are great study guides too, by the way, great study guides, because once again you can see the information that's related. I've even had teachers that I've talked into um, where if the child gets this level of information, so the subtopics, if they can get that amount of information, the teacher will write 75% of their test based on those main subtopics. And the child, if they study even at that depth, has a chance of getting a legitimate C. Then if they study at the next level, which is going to basically be some of the main ideas, then they can get a B. So the next 15% of the questions are basically going to be questions at this level. And then finally, the 10% of the questions are down at that detail level, where basically if you study at that level, you'll get an A. Um, and this kind of organization helps children study a lot better than trying to just tackle a text. But the whole point is for them to start to internalize these structures so that without your help making graphic organizers, they're going to be able to 
visualize these organizers and recognize it in the text as they read, just like they start to improve in narrative discourse if we actually work on narrative discourse. So again, this is just a nice compensatory mechanism for kids who need help studying or comprehending. It also becomes an in the goal of internalizing those structures so just like other kids, they start to see the patterns of the discourse. Here's another procedural one that I've had a lot of fun with, How Spiders Eat. This was another one that had a little bit of Kinspiration, kinspiration pictures in it. Um, so they capture is one of the subtopics. They inject and they liquefy. So spiders capture their food in a web using their and then using their poison gland, which is comprised of a fang and a duct and a fang tip, they that are pointed down, they basically inject the poison into the prey with their needle like fang tips. Once they've injected it, they start to insert their digestive juices. They are in the meanwhile um, doing two things to their prey. They're grabbing it with their fang tube and they're also chewing on the insect. And then that process turns the bug or whatever they're eating into a liquid that they can suck the insides out of the um, out of the infant or they can pour this liquid over something. So basically um, we've had fun with this. We've taken baggies and we've become the spiders and so we've taken baggies with straws so we capture our prey and our prey is something like red Kool-Aid and then we inject our digestive juices which is just a little bit of water in the baggie and then we insert our fang tube which is our straw and then we turn it to liquid and stir it up a little bit and then start sucking the insides out of our insect which was in our baggie. Anyway, it's fun. These are other kinds of sequence go charts. So you can use your phonic faces train. So instead of just putting the sounds on it, it can be concepts. First, this capture, the spider has to capture the insect. Then the spider has to um, put his digestive ju juices into the insect. And then he has to suck up the insect's nutrition. Um, these are ones that are just step by step. This is another sequencing thing that's very similar to the train. This is another temporal sequence if it's got many steps in the sequence. So basically all of those are go charts. But again I like the hierarchical one because it does a better job of displaying not only the main subtopics this one is probably okay. These are the subtopics, these are the main ideas, and then you can put some details. Um, but it's less visually displayed than the graphic, than the hierarchical type. All right, the next level is cause effect. This one has causality or a reactive sequence. So the reaction means that the co the effect is just a reaction to the cause that nobody planned it. So we've got our topic, we've got our main idea, second main idea, third main idea, and now something in the detail caused the next thing to happen. Something in the detail of the second idea caused the third thing to happen. So now you've got the causality between the ideas and not just the temporal sequence. So it links reasons with results. Has to have an interaction between at least two ideas or events. Takes on the action and other results from the action. As we said, it's physical causality rather than psychologically. Nobody planned it. And there may be several reasons or why an event occurred or several effects from one cause. And so again, we'll have layers of details. 
All right, so let's look at an example of one of these. There are four stages in the life cycle of a butterfly. The adult butterfly lays her round eggs on leaves. They attach to two leaves near a food source they will need when they transform into caterpillars and hatch. The caterpillar is worm-like and often colorful with patterns and may have tiny hairs. A caterpillar eats all the time and sheds its skin four times as it grows. Then the caterpillar spins a chrysalis or hard casing where it remains for weeks or months. Once again, the, once again its body transforms. When it leaves the chrysalis, it's a beautiful butterfly. I actually saw, once when I was a kid, a monarch butterfly breaking out of its chrysalis. It was the most beautiful, fascinating thing, and it was soaking wet when it first came out, um, and totally helpless, so it could have, you know, easily been eaten. Um, and then gradually the sun dried out its wings, and as it was drying out, they would start to unfold, and then it finally flew away. And I must have sat there watching that for an hour, and it was just one of the best things in my life. Anyway, so first we have the eggs, and they are placed on leaves and then the leaves are attached near the food um, and then they transform and the transformation causes them to become a caterpillar and then we have our description of what a caterpillar looks like and how it grows and then that growing causes it to basically become an adult where it makes a chrysalis then we have our definitions of chrysalis and then that transformation basically gives it a new body and causes it to become a butterfly Um, this is just a general kind of cause effect. So what were the causes? What were the effects? It's a little more sophisticated for older kids where there's a thesis statement and a concluding sentence. So the thesis sentence would be your introductory paragraph and your concluding sentence would you know, be that end where you summarize the information. Um, you can have as many of these different levels of cause and effect as you need and as many levels of detail as you need. So that's just sort of a rubric for one of these. There are other forms of cause effect besides the hierarchical one. This one's a decision chart. So basically you answer a bunch of little questions until you come to the conclusion. Um, and the same thing over here in terms of cause effect. Here are others here's the cause and what kind of effects does it have and what kind of effects do they have on each other all right the next level is problem solution once again you have to have this interaction between two or more factors one factor cites a problem and the other factor provides the potential answer to that problem now it has a topic just like a descriptive list. It has a temporal sequence, just like an ordered sequence. It has causality, just like a reactive sequence, but this time it also has a plan. So if you've got a problem, you have to actually mentally plan for a solution. Um, and then possible solutions can be proposed with possible results, and then this, finally the solution that was chosen. So it's just like a story where you've got um, Goldilocks with her with her problem she was hungry and there were several possible solutions she could have Papa Bear's porridge but its effect was it was too hot Mama Bear's porridge but possible effect was it would be good but it wasn't it was too cold and then finally the solution that was chosen was Baby Bear's porridge because it was just right so once again this is not real foreign from narrative discourse. It has all of the same kinds of properties. And it goes up in terms of complexity from topic to topic plus sequence to topic plus causality to now topic plus plan just like narrative discourse does. So we've got problem, subtopic, and solution subtopic with main ideas under each and details under the main ideas. So here's an example. With our growing population, the water supply in many areas of the country is limited. Humans have many uses for water. Some of them are personal needs, such as drinking, cooking, and cleaning. Humans also need water for plants, including crops, plants that are part of the landscape at home, and in public places and plants in their home. We can see um, some trigger words or you know words that tell you that 
there are different levels of subtopic. So it says some of them are personal. So some refers back to uses of water. So that's going to be, you know, one thing. Humans also need water for plants. And so also is a trigger word that tells you it's going to be another one of these main ideas. And in order to have enough water for all um, human needs, one solution is to conserve water. So our problem was we need water because of our uses and the other solution might be conservation and then again we are going through in order to have enough water for all human needs one solution is conserve water the two primary ways so that tells us that there's going to be two of these main topics or main subtopics to conserve water are by recycling water and then it gives a definition of that um, or by limiting water use and then it gives some details supporting that so once again, you can help children to comprehend the passage by working with them to fill out a compare and contrast hierarchical organizer. So you can you know, show where these different levels of information exist and which ones are at the same level all the way down to the levels of detail. So this would really help with comprehension. And then if you want to turn it into an expressive piece, you can scaffold their talking about it or you can scaffold having the children write about these topics. It does not take very much information. As you can see, this would easily, easily fill a couple of sessions. So you might work for a week on just this one paragraph of information with the goal of helping them understand all those layers of meaning. What is the problem and what is the solution? And then what are the arguments under each one of those? You can see that there's um, trigger words like neither nor, infinitive clauses, noun phrase complements, and other complex syntactic forms when you get into this level of discourse. So it's not only the discourse structures that are getting long and complex, but also the syntax is getting complex. You can you know, help children look for those words like neither nor some also that are going to help them understand those are signaling different things that are at the same level that need to be considered. Here's another fun one that we've had that has to do with that water that we used a lot of pictures with Kidspiration. So it's basically the same thing that we just looked at, but again filled with a few more details that are, and then a lot more pictures to visualize those things. Other problem solution go charts you can see here. For younger kids where we're just getting started, some of these simple problem solution kinds of go charts could be useful. Um, this one has a place for a few more details, but again, I just find the hierarchical ones easiest to use when we're trying to get children to really understand how to interpret, I can get back to it, how to interpret a passage and where all of the bits of information fall and which ones are the topic, the main ideas, or the subtopics, I mean, rather, the main ideas and then the details. And then finally, the complete structure is going to compare and contrast. So it compares by similarities, the way that people, events, or things are alike. You may be physical, you may have physical comparisons like color, size, and shape, or it can be use, so actions or other similar characteristics. The contrast may be internal like feelings or reactions as well as some of these same external characteristics. And here again is a list of signal words. These are the compare signal words. Similarly, like, still, likewise, in the same, in, at the same time, in the same manner, um, in the same way, comparison, time, etc. 
Contrast organizes the information by differences, way that those people have answered things or ideas are different from each other. They also have signal words. So, however, rather, on the other hand, on the contrary, but yet, nonetheless, nevertheless, conversely, in contrast. So we have a topic, and we've got a couple of subtopics that contrast with each other, with each having their own main ideas. And then we might have a subtopic where we're comparing things that are similar between those two subtopics. So we're comparing and contrasting. Here's one of my favorites to work with kids on this level. Great apes such as gorillas, orangutans, and chimpanzees sleep in nests. They often build a nest each night because they travel to new food sources. Chimps mostly live in the trees because they are good climbers and only weigh 90 pounds. They build their nests in high branches for protection. Similarly, female gorillas build nests in trees for protection, but they are built in the forks of trees. In contrast, male gorillas weigh 350 pounds or more and are too heavy for branches to support. They build their nests on the ground. Both chimps and gorillas use small branches and leaves to build their nests, but gorillas use dung to help give their nest its shape. Kids love that one. Okay, so basically we have the comparison. They build new nests each night, meaning chips and chimps and gorillas, and both of them are going to use trees, but for different reasons. All right. Um, this actually comes from a book that has accompanying pictures. And so the first thing that I do with my kids is we help them pick a topic. So we look through the book and it has interesting topics that compare and contrast gorillas and chimps. Um, so this one is one when we chose to look at the topic of building of the nest. We discussed the target text structure. And so we've got things about gorillas and chimpanzees are well suited for life. It starts comparing them. This tells us that they only weigh 90 pounds, but the gorillas weigh 350 pounds. So this one gave us information about the, you know, the life in the trees and why the gorilla is more earthbound and the chimp is more tree bound. And then we also found the page where it talks about the building of the nest. So we use facts from two different places in the story to build our graphic organizer. We found that by looking at the table of contents and also the index. And so I find that the children, these are older kids now, uh, basically do not know how to use these tools and they don't know how to use headings and subheadings. So one of the things that we do is just figuring out once we've got a topic that we want to know more about, we use things like headings and table of contents and index to find the information that we need in order to get a more complete understanding of our compare and our contrast topic. Then we also start reading the topic sentences and say, well, is this going to have information that's going to be related to our, our topic? Um, so this one says they are well suited for their life in the trees. They are good at climbing and swinging and hanging. They've got very long arms. So, you know, it's less related than this weight paragraph. Male chimpanzees weigh 90 pounds, um, while the gorilla weighs 350 pounds, twice the weight of the average human. They have to spend a lot of time on the ground. So this becomes the paragraph that's more important to our discussion of nest building rather than the shape of their hands or feet. Okay, we decide if the key information compares or contrasts key features. So is this statement in this sentence comparing information or is it contrasting information? Is it saying how they're the same or is it saying how they're different? And then we organize the information on a graphic organizer and try to maintain parallel structure. So this is the graphic organizer we typically use. So we've got building nests, we've got chimps versus gorillas. And then we're going to start, whatever we do on this side, we're also going to do on this side. So that's what I'm saying when we have parallel structures. Whenever we have a main point over here, if we're contrasting it, then there has to be a similar main point over here or subtopic over here. If we have a 
you know, main point or a subtopic over here, then there has to be a similar one over here because that's how compare and contrast works. So chimps build their nests in trees, but gorillas build theirs on the ground. Chimps build mattresses and gorillas also build mattresses. Um, chimps weigh only 90 pounds, but gorillas weigh 350 pounds. So they're too heavy for trees, but these guys have to stay in the trees because they need the protection. The gorilla doesn't need protection because they have no natural enemies. So basically we read through our passages, we figure out what these main ideas are, we write down a bunch of terms that we got from the story, and then we figure out how to best organize it on the graphic organizer so that we're keeping our parallel structures. So that might take one or two sessions just to build your graphic organizer and understand how to comprehend, compare and contrast discourse. Then we'll turn around and start talking from it and then finally writing from it. So we organize the information for better comprehension, then we write a paper at the last step using our scaffolding strategies. Here are some other compare and contrast go charts. And again, these help you see the big picture. I don't like them as well as hierarchical because, you know, then the information just sort of gets written in here randomly as opposed to staying at those different levels. But for understanding the big picture, they're very good visualizations of what a compare and contrast looks like. And you can basically see, if we put the circles here and here, the stuff in the middle would be what's inside the Venn diagram. So this keeps that basic premise, it's just in a different shape, with more opportunities for levels to be displayed. All right, level f eight is going to be the compound level. Now in narrative, this was like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, where one episode comes to an end before the next one begins. So first we had Goldilocks going into the Three Bears' house. Well, first we had the episode of the Three Bears leaving their house. And then Goldilocks arriving with the problem of being hungry. So we had the episode um, where she tries everybody's food, and that came to an end. Then we had sitting in a chair, and that came to an end. And then we had sleeping in the bed, and that came to an end when the bear's story merged with Goldilocks's story. So we see the same sort of compound structure in most discourse, so uh, expository discourse, because we don't just usually end with a single paragraph. Tigers are among the animals known as big cats. The largest of the tigers, the Siberian tiger, can reach almost 300 kilograms or 650 pounds and up to four meters in length, including a tail about a meter long. The tiger's hind legs are longer than those of the front, which allows them to jump powerfully. So thinking about this, this one is basically describing okay, the size of the tiger. The next one, the coat of the tiger ranges from light fawn color to a rich auburn gold. Okay, and then it gives you lots of information about that. So it's another episode. So this would be eating the porridge and this would be sitting in the chair. So this text might go on for 20 pages and have many, many, many compounded episodes or discussions. Okay. Um, One subtopic is not embedded within another, so they only talk about size or they only talk about color and they don't embed the two. So it's independent and you could switch the order. I could talk about basically um, the color of it before I talk about the size. Now, that's a very common one. However, you can have episodes themselves which have cause effect or sequences or problem solution, etc. So basically a compound is made up of two or more other kinds of discourse structures thrown together um, in some sort of a, you know, 
idea that comes or topic that comes to an end and then another topic starts up. So you can have all kinds of layers of different kinds of more complex discourse structures. So this one could just be a list and this one could have all kinds of cause effect or compare and contrast. And actually it does have compare and contrast. The actual color depends on where the, the tiger is situated. The Siberian tiger has yellow coat and white stripes while the Sumatran has reddish colored with closely set stripes. So this is actually written in compare and contrast. So just because it's compound doesn't mean that it's all going to just be lists of information. Each one of the episodes can have its own text structure. So that's the compound level. And we just talked about this. Compare and contrast. And then the final topic, we learn that the tiger first surrounds its prey and then it moves in closer for an attack. Finally, they kill their prey by biting and squeezing the victim's throat. So this is an ordered sequence and probably even causal sequence. Yeah, this one would actually have to be a... All right. Well, I've got it. I've got it. Um, now that I'm rereading it, it basically does have a, a ordered sequence in it, but it also has causality and maybe even some planning. Um, so at least it's reactive to seeing the prey. It depends on if you think the tigers think and plan or if they're all just working instinctively. So I've got that a little bit too low. All right. So basically that's going to be the macro structure or basically what it looks like. We've got a subtopic of big cats, the Siberian versus the Sumatran, which were compared and contrast, and then hunting. Complex text is like text is like Crew Develle, where you've got some parallel things going on. So two or more antagonistic. Um, very common in history, may also be found in science and other content areas. And once again, you can have many, many layers of, you know, things that are just paragraphs or text that are just descriptive lists, some that are reactive sequences, some that are ordered sequences, some that have plans, some that are complete with compare and contrast. So you can have all kinds of levels of discourse within this overall complex text structure. This is obviously pulled out of the middle of something, but it says there was something over here that was mentioned. And then it says, for example, in 1991, countries who would later become the Allies developed the Treaty of Versailles to make Germany pay for the damage World War I had caused. Germany was forced to sign it, but the people thought it was too harsh. The country was very poor and the price of food and basic goods was high. This led to the election of Hitler as Chancellor of Germany, who almost immediately began to build up a secret army in defiance of the treaty. Britain and France were aware of Hitler's actions, but they were more worried about the rise of communism and they didn't want to start another war with Germany. And so this allowed Germany to begin attacking countries and taking back the land. Several politicians agreed that Germany had the right to rearm, including the Prime Minister of Britain, and they established a policy of appeasement, but he broke the agreement by invading Czechoslovakia. So basically we've got, you know, countries that thought that Germany should have these you know, the restrictions and shouldn't be allowed to do things. You've got Germany who's thinking, yes, we should be able to, and they had a few allies. So you've got these two contrasting points of view that resulted in that whole horrible history. So we've got the allies versus the axis. And so we've got this one was in a sequence. What happened? We had the England and the France and the United States that believed in harsh punishment. Then we had the Treaty of Versailles, and then we had the League of the Nations, and that was the sequence. And over here, we had the description um, of some of the things that happened. So anyway, opposite goals, reciprocal effects on each other with all these different micro and macro structures. And finally, the interactive 
in Texas about 75 million years ago. One of the largest armored dinosaurs was roaming through the forest named Edamontia. He was over 23 feet, three feet long with huge powerful legs needed for some, to support his 8,000 pounds. He is well protected with body covering along his long sharp horns that include including large forward pointing shoulder spines and large spikes on his sides. He knew how to fight, but he didn't kill other dinosaurs unless they were threatened. Edmontonia was a plant eater with a sharp beak used to cut plants and pouches in his cheek for fooing. Not all dinosaurs were plant eaters, and then this discussion continues for several pages. We first learned about Edmontia in 1924, so we've gone from 75 million years ago into 1924. So basically, we've, you know, embedding different kinds of time frames, and now it's going to talk about, you know, how they actually discovered him and what he looked like, and then in today's scientists, and so now in the 2016s, etc., um, they're talking about things that happened 40 million years ago and 230 million years ago, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in relationship to this discovery, and then how the dinosaurs, he lived during the last dinosaur age, and so. They had to figure out how they become extinct in 2004. They proposed a six-mile circular asteroid, blah, blah, blah. So basically, we're jumping back and forth between perspectives, time frames, and all of this has to somehow interact for the reader to have the full understanding of Edmontonia. Uh -huh. So, while expository discourse is going to be important for comprehension. Um, it's also going to require all of the other language levels that we've talked about in this class and some we haven't talked about yet. So in order to be successful, you have to understand phonology and the spelling patterns or orthography, the cohesion. So when he refers back to something three paragraphs earlier, the pragmatics, the morphology, the syntax, the propositions, which I'm again are basically those ideas that we're outlining. Um, semantics and higher level meaning, so all the inferences and just having the vocabulary. So while working on expository structure is going to be critical for improving comprehension, it also has to be in the context of working on all of the things that the child might be having difficulty with. So that's our discussion of expository discourse. I hope that it helped you understand some of the exciting things that you can do in therapy that are just great and fun. Um, like with our spiders, they can be very hands-on for the younger kids so that they can actually experience being um, the spider catching the prey. For our older kids, you know, it can be visualizing in an outlining format the complex discourse structures so that they can better comprehend and then produce those kinds of structures themselves. Thank you and we'll see you next month.